So let me uh, introduce you our main speakers. Um, so we have three speakers and a bonus speaker. Uh, so we'll start off with uh, Imre Evan Kraligan, um, who is doing her PhD on the role and impact of mobile technology and technological mediation in higher education in Norway. Imre is based in Oslo. Uh, Jack, PhD, uh, Jack Reed's PhD is on the influences of network, networked spaces on experiences of residential outdoor education at the Outward Bound Trust in the UK. And Dave Hills, uh, Jack, I should say, is, is based in Edinburgh. And uh, Dave Hills, uh, uh, who is based at the University of the Sunshine Coast in Australia, uh, his PhD is on optimizing the management of digital technology in outdoor education. Now, I am super excited by uh, having these three PhD students here precisely, not only because they're lovely people and smart people and have a lot to offer, but uh, I always think it's the PhD students out there who are the most on top of the literature. They're the ones who are immersed in it uh, day after day, week after week, uh, year after year, hopefully not too many years. Uh, so it's wonderful to be able to bring up this really current uh, knowledge of the, uh, of the field. We've also asked uh, Brendan Munch from uh, Australia to join us as what I would call an offsider, an offsider. So he's going to join us um, in the plenary. Um, he, Brendan has a lot of experience working with uh, outdoor technology at the tertiary level, especially, and uh, he's been invited. We've asked him along to kind of um, challenge some of the points being made by the presenters and uh, maybe act as a sort of, uh, to, to, uh, we want him along with some of you others to, to feel like you can be critical. You don't have to believe everything that you're being that is being presented to you. And we we want to be asking the difficult questions of uh, yeah, well, sure, but how would that work in the real world in practice? So Dave's going to uh, join us for, or sorry, Brandon rather will uh, will take on an, an additional role there. Um, right, just a couple more. Uh, bits of introduction, and then uh, we will be off to the races. Um, and our, our, uh, our working definition today for um, digital technologies is uh, electronic tools, systems, and devices that can record, store, process, and present information. Electronic tools and systems and devices that can record, store, process, and present information. And we want this, we mean this to include all parts of the experience. This is before going into the field, during and after the experience. And it could be on expeditions, residential experiences, local learning outside the classroom and so on. Um, I'll also say that there's always been technology in outdoor education. And uh, Bob Henderson years ago said to me, Oh, there's always been technology in outdoor ed. Just look at the canoe. Its design was so good that the, it hasn't changed in a thousand years. Uh, but the, with the advent of digital technology, however, and the rapid rise uh, and ubiquity of digital technology in our outdoor education practices, uh, seems to have raised all kinds of questions, dilemmas, conflicts, and so on that, that occur here at the, the, the intersection between mobile technology use and working with people outdoors. And it's the belief of the people who are presenting today and the organizing group uh, of this, uh, this webinar that there is a disproportionately low amount of rigorous research that has been done on these kinds of practices. So that is the rationale for this webinar. That's why we're here. We're here to generate some discussion around uh, this intersection of, 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 of outdoor learning and uh, digital technology. Uh, and we want to hear from you as well, as I said. So I think I've said all that I should do. It's uh, 11 minutes past the hour. And let's get started. Any burning questions before we continue? I can't see everybody's hands, but maybe put it in the chat if you think, hang on, I have a burning question. You can't begin yet.
Right. You've had your opportunity to a ask a burning question. Okay. Let's kick this off. So jazzed that you're all here. We've got 68 people uh, joining us live. So, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, so this is our first um, statement that uh, the three panelists are going to respond to. The use of digital technology in outdoor education is fundamentally contrary to all its values. Mm. Okay. Jack, you're on. Great. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, and yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, nice to see loads of uh, familiar names and also some new names. So, so yeah, hi from, from Edinburgh. Um, now, I thought I should probably get started here by asking what are the kind of key values in British outdoor education? That's the context that I'm in here. So I don't spend to, I don't tend to spend too much kind of time on this, um, but the values which underpin British outdoor um, and specifically adventurous education can at least kind of be traced back to the Romantic period. Um, but I think perhaps can also be traced back to the kind of post Second World War era um, and concentrates on adventure as a kind of medium for personal development um, and also personal growth. Um, this is something that a colleague and I recently discussed in a small scale paper on fear um, in outdoor learning. Um, but I think there's also value placed on accessing kind of natural places which disconnect us from what are kind of like fast paced and I think also kind of technological lives. Um, and we see this emphasized in writing such as um, Brian Watchow's, for instance, um, Pedagogy of Production um, and Payne and Watchow's um, Slow Pedagogy for Post-Traditional Outdoor Education. So I think really this five minutes is going to be focusing on, on this disconnection um, and in some ways this kind of focus on experiential purity, um, uh, yeah, like I say, in the next sort of five minutes or so. So looking at point two, um, when thinking about the kind of removal of phones um, and subsequently social media, um, informal outdoor education at least, I think we could run into a problem when we think about just how connected young people are in contemporary society. So we know that young people, or at least the kind of um, generation Zs and generation Alphas of global north societies, so that's the kind of um, those born from the late 1990s through to the, the present day or so, know nothing different than a world that is both technologically sustained and critically also technologically reliant. Um, and I think whether it be Snapchat and TikTok or text messaging and WhatsApp, the young people who, who take part in outdoor education are kind of part of a, a networked environment which facilitates and sustains aspects of young people's lives, um, particularly aspects such as community, um, friendship, and also critically identity. Um, and of course, we also see um, relationship and community development as core program outcomes in outdoor education. Um, so it's the position of kind of network spaces um, that they naturally become an integral part of learning outdoors. So whilst young people might not necessarily be on their phones during formal activities such as caving or um, maybe rock climbing, um, they will undoubtedly be part of these networks back channels um, before and after these formal learning experiences. Um, and I think crucially here, um, network spaces also offer opportunity for outdoor learning to continue long after the initial experience. Um, so things such as sharing images, uh, new friends, um, maybe even social media posts themselves can kind of provide a, a living archive um, which may be re revisited by young people for years to come after their initial experience. Um, this kind of creates a, a new arena, I think, in outdoor education for young people to make sense of these forms of experience. So then moving on to my third and final point, from a kind of networked and connectivity perspective, um, which of course naturally includes mobile technology and social media, I personally um, am unconvinced that these forms of mobile technology are fundamentally contrary for outdoor education. Um, I believe that leveraging these spaces can potentially at least further, further the impact of meaningful and long-lived outcomes when taking learning beyond the classroom. So, in light of that, I think I, I would like to at least conclude with my own positionality statement, um, and that is that 
network spaces and connectivity play a critical role in and beyond outdoor education. So as practitioners, we of course have a choice about whether we include technology and practice or not, but it's absolutely important that we recognize that all of our participants will arrive, take part and leave this, uh, these outdoor learning contexts as part of numerous online networks, um, which of course facilitate interpersonal connection, um, friendship, and critically, I think, memories. Um, so with that in mind, I'd now like to pass back to Simon, who I think will pass on to Imre. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. Right on time. Let's see. There we go, over to Imre. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jack, for kicking this off. Um, as you can see on the slide, I'll be giving um, a perspective from the Norwegian context. And I also would like to start with um, sharing some of the key values from the Norwegian context as uh, internationally, there is no clear statement of what exactly the key values are uh, in outdoor education. So similar to the context of um, the UK, outdoor education in Norway has its roots um, in a tradition, the Norwegian tradition of outdoor life, which is called friluftsliv in, um, in Norwegian. And this also dates back to the romantic period and the back to nature movement, where the friluftsliv tradition aimed to offer a break from the distresses from everyday urban life and to help reconnect the urban population to nature. So these ideals um, continue to develop uh, from exploring kind of what at that time was still considered wild nature or free nature, um, and also relying on one's own personal skills to manage oneself in the outdoors with limited equipment and simple means. And until today, that um, tradition of Friedrichsleaf is still intertwined with also this idea still that uh, spending time out in nature is good for people's overall well being, so physical, mental, and emotional well being. And that holds a very strong position in Norway's public policy, but also in the educational policy. So for a long time, outdoor education in Norway has kind of reflected these original values of skill development and also personal development and the direct experience of nature. And I added a, an extra um, key value here that I think is important, which is the environmental awareness, which um, as, I, as I understand it, developed a little bit later on when the Norwegian eco-philosophical traditions emerged that argued that a connection or experience of nature helps us develop a connection to nature and raise environmental awareness. So these are the key values in the Norwegian tradition of outdoor life and uh, outdoor education in Norway. However, if we look at the practice today, we see more and more use of advanced equipment and people recording and sharing their outdoor pursuits um, with various digital and mobile technologies. And increasingly, we see also that these technologies are used in the planning and the enactment of outdoor education curricula. So as I understand it, these key values, um, when we look at them from a perspective of using digital technologies, it really depends on our approach, whether we say that these technologies either hinder or can support the key values of outdoor education. For example, if we look at the first two, the skill development and social and personal development, um, one can say that from the traditional approach, managing oneself in the outdoors with simple means and limited equipment, the use of digital technologies would not fit in, in that picture of developing the basic skills. However, if we look from um, a pedagogical approach, there's a clear example of using, for example, uh, how-to videos that are very popular nowadays that can help and support independent learning, for example, when students or participants are preparing for a trip. And the same is with social and personal development. Um, we can look at the use of video or photographic journals uh, in terms of reflecting on an experience and um, having a creative tool to process a learning experience, um, which 
is kind of the modern or digital approach to then a field diary. Um, however, when we look at the third point, I think this is perhaps the most challenging value, the development of a connection to nature and the direct experience of nature. Um, because when we use digital technologies in the outdoors, we have a relation from uh, that shifts from a human nature connection to a human technology nature interface, where technology becomes a mediator of human experience. And we can, for example, think about how we read online maps or GPS rather than learning to read the features of the landscape by using a map and by learning to recognize, recognize certain aspects of, of the landscape. So I too would like to send or to share my personal uh, statement, which is that I think um, that it's unrealistic to state that we can or must avoid using digital technology in outdoor educational practices. But I think instead we should focus on learning about and gaining a deeper understanding of the impact of digital means how we can use their potential and how we can mitigate the disadvantages and that we should continuously uh, reflect on this rather than avoiding to talk about this or denying that digital technologies in any way influence the field. And we need to learn about this and understand it so that we can make better informed decisions about when, where, how to use it or not use it for that matter. I think that was it for now. <laughs> so I'll hand the word to Simon and I think he will pass it on to Dave. Thanks, Timra. Over to you, Dave Hills. Thanks, Simon. Um, thanks for everyone for coming. It's great to see a, a great representation of countries in the chat. It's fantastic to be here. And I've really enjoyed working with um, Jack and Imre for the past few months. And thanks very much for hosting, Simon. Um, at this stage, I just wanted to recognize the contribution of my um, supervisor, Glenn Thomas, as well in my work. Um, I know he's also in the um, feed and he's currently camped out in the field. So it's a good effort that he could dial in. So my response to this question, um, the use of the digital technology is fundamentally contrary to its values. The way my research would contribute to this, um, and I've been doing my PhD now for the last four, four and a half years. Um, I've just finished Writing up my data, um, I surveyed over 150 outdoor educators um, from over 20 countries and completed in-depth interviews with over 30 participants um, in over eight countries. And what my, res my research is suggesting three things that really would possibly mediate how an outdoor educator would respond to that statement or what mediates responses to that statement. Um, I represented them on my slide. Uh, they're the pedagogical considerations, the uh, five points there on the left, the application of outdoor education, um, and really I found it's people's response to the statement below, um, which tends to invoke people's response to that statement and their opinion on technology. So I found um, that the optimal management of technology and outdoor education, whether that's including it or excluding it, is really con critically considering and responding effectively to those five pedagogical considerations. So thinking about the facilitators, the students and the learning outcomes, whether they're formalized or not, whether they're agreed or not, but really making that uh, management of technology bespoke to those three top things I found or my research has suggested is really key. Th those two key things at the bottom, um, the application of out education and the organizational values, um, to link into Jack and Imre's uh, slides, in Australia, um, outdoor education Australia articulate three applications to, uh, of outdoor education on the website, um, a standalone subject, a field trip or camp, and a teaching methodology. And my research has shown that really that tends to vary the um, management of technology. If you're applying outdoor education in the context of like any other subject, then often technology has been just as relevant. Whereas if you're perhaps applying outdoor education in its, pure, in its purest form as a methodology or a pedagogy, then I, my research has shown that at times it's less relevant. The other thing I found um, in collecting my data is that each organization has their own values and every educator has their own values of what outdoor education is. 
And sometimes it's that conflict of values which just causes that conflict between the inclusion and exclusion of technology. So I found it fairly effective to simply ask people the question at the bottom that to what extent is your application of outdoor education in your session a break from the norm of education? For some outdoor educators that I've spoken to, um, it's not. It's another field of education that's led into the rest of the curriculum um, and technology is normal and it's laid in like everything else for others they're delivering outdoor education as a as something different you know um, a complete break from the norm a disconnection and for them that statement is correct use about the use of technology in outdoor education is is fundamentally contrary to its values so i think that um i'd like to point out i'm not advocating for or against technology in outdoor education um i think i'm just advocating frameworks for outdoor educators to make evidence-based critical decisions about how it's managed and if you would like to read a bit more about that um, me and Glenn published a framework upon this work a, a year ago um, and I'll put the link in the chat if people would like to read more about this um, construct. Thanks Simon. Thank you Dave and thanks uh, all three uh, of you for getting us off to a great start. Um, so now we're, this is the discussion for part two here. So if we can accept, so that is, that, that this is an if, if we can accept that digital technology is embedded in outdoor education, what do we know about its potential and what are key areas to explore more deeply? And I think that's just to, to, to kind of bring back, bring people back to the, the rationale behind this webinar is we're suggesting that there's, I mean, just as we're seeing in the um, in the chat here, there's a huge amount of experience, um, critical thinking, and so on in the world of outdoor education and using uh, digital technology. But there is still a pretty limited that, that literature is limited in terms of what's uh, uh, been uh, done empirically and uh, and has been published in in uh, reliable outlets. So let's kick things off. Part, part de, away you go, Dave. Fantastic, thanks Simon. And a, a great comment there from Greg um, in the chat, it's just led nicely into my slide. He was asking about when we're gonna talk about VR and AR, and that's exactly what I'm gonna talk about now. I'm also gonna pick up on um, affordance theory that we've been speaking about. And again, highlight some of the um, literature which is coming out to, uh, to read a bit more about this topic. Um, so those of you that haven't come across it, um, affordance theory or technological affordance theory that we've been mentioning is some fantastic research coming out which articulates this balance or imbalance with technology in society. Basically, affordance theory is all about the balance between technological determinism on the one hand and social constructivism on the other. And we see this throughout the discussion that we've had today. We see it politically, we see it socially, and it's only going to play out more, I think, in the coming years. So my research has identified five affordances of technology um, in the outdoor education, all of which have an equal and opposing side to including and excluding tech. And they are safety, um, learning and engagement, place and environmental connection, and teamwork and collaboration. And what I've seen from interviewing 30 people and 150 survey responses from those 12 different countries is that every time you include or exclude technology, you always gain something, but then you always lose it as well. So in some ways, technology we know makes our um, operations safer, but they also make them less safe as well. We know that they engage people and turn the task, but they also distract them at the same time. So affordance theory really prompts us to look critically at both sides of the affordance in making that decision and trying to think, okay, if I remove everybody's phones, if I remove everyone's iPads, or if I give them a digital device, what am I gonna gain and what am I gonna lose? So what I found in my data is regardless of your position on technology and outdoor education, you're always gonna gain something and lose something. And that's quite a, a, a nice balanced way to look at it. Um, to answer the, the, the second part of the question on the slide, um, where to next and what do we need to explore more deeply? 
Um, as Greg mentioned, you, we can't have this discussion without talking about Apple Glass. Um, we know Apple are, are really good at disrupting sectors, and I believe that it's coming next year and Apple are going to disrupt a lot of our world um, for the better and the worse. Um, Apple Glass, the um, augmented reality version of what they're bringing out, is uh, tipped to replace computers and phones. Um, screen companies are getting out of business with these revelations, and um, they think that's all you'll need in the outdoors, which clearly has a huge issue for our, our sector in terms of disconnecting people and in terms of getting people to unplug and an unfiltered experience to nature. But looking at it from an affordance theory standpoint, it might create a greater need to disconnect and take off those glasses and engage in the outdoors and outdoor education might become one of those long one true places where you can completely switch off and take that filter off but i think as a as a profession we really need to be proactive um, and not reactive to um, apple's next big disruption um, use it to our advantages um, take uh, um, all the opportunities it gives us um, and, and manage, it, manage it effectively before students start turning up on our sessions with these devices. So um, I'm hoping to address um, a lot of these things in future and um, really um, continue this work. I, I wanted to highlight a book chapter that I've got coming out next year. I'll put the link in the thread. It's a chapter in um, Glenn, um, Janet and um, Heather's book. And um, hopefully if you want to read more about affordance theory and these topics, um, please check it out. Thanks, Simon. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Over to you, Imre. Thank you. Um, well, some of the points that I want to discuss have already briefly come up, um, which I hope I can just elaborate a little bit more on, and I'll also build a little bit more on uh, Dave's affordance theory. Um, so my focus, uh, as mentioned earlier, is on mobile technology specifically. Um, and I think this topic has become especially interesting and even more relevant than it was before during the pandemic where digital mobile technologies have facilitated the concept of learning anytime, anywhere, uh, perhaps more than ever before. Um, so when we look at the potential of mobile technology, I think there's two obvious main characteristics, which is mobility and uh, portability, um, which together they refer, of course, to that uh, users can communicate at any time, anywhere with anyone, um, and the fact that their wireless uh, make it able for us to bring them along wherever we go and connect to any network, um, which, of course, depending on the on the context or on the place. Um, I know that in Norway, the 4G and 5G is expanding to almost anywhere, uh, even further in the mountains. So this mobility and portability have some uh, obvious benefits um, for facilitating learning out of doors. Um, so Dave already introduced the affordances, um, but some of the benefits are um, the access to information. So I think what we use very often is checking the weather info, checking uh, information about the local environment, planning transportation, um, perhaps in winter trips, checking avalanche um, warnings or having specific applications for avalanches. Uh, of course, we can communicate with our colleagues, our students or participants, or in case of emergency, um, and it enables, enables us to document and share information. And these are only some, some of the benefits, but of course there's also pitfalls that we should consider in terms of um, what already has been mentioned, uh, issues of equity in terms of availability, cost and access to the devices and also of course access to networks, but also the use of mobile and digital technologies um, in terms of how they can distract from a specific learning activity. Um, that they may hinder direct experience of nature, but also that they can increase risk in terms of providing a technology-driven sense of false safety, where participants or students may go into areas 
for which they don't have the actual skills um, to roam those areas. And if something happens or if the technology fails, they are left on their own and have to rely on their own skills. So these are important considerations. Um, based on the, the systematized review I did, which hopefully will be, um, it is accepted, it will be hopefully online uh, available very soon. Um, but I framed these affordances uh, under three considerations for employing mobile technology, which are listed here on the on the PowerPoint slide. And I think regardless of all the potential of, of digital technology, it's very important that we don't use digital and mobile technologies uncritically um, because they may indeed hinder the teaching and learning objectives. So we should minimize usage and criti uh, critically reflect um, if we need to use them and why we need to use them. So that relates to the second point, the intentionality, so that we set very clear pedagogical intentions, not just for ourselves, but also reflect on how do we convey these intentions to the participants or to the students? How do we convey these messages of why do we use this device or why do we use this application exactly in this moment? What are the risks that are involved and what are the benefits? And then the adaptation, um, based on the suggestions that I've, I've read, uh, some of the most important points are to use interactive, informative, and creative tasks that are also based on teamwork, collaboration, um, but that definitely don't make the device or the application the focus point. So that the distractive kind of effect uh, is mitigated in that way. And I think through all of that, continuously reflecting um, is, is very important that we don't, uh, that any use, but also any non-use of digital technology um, requires critical examination. And as I already mentioned in one of the comments in the discussion round, that we have to consider the different stages. So the, the planning, the enactment or during an activity and the post activity or reflection and evaluation phases. Um, and that is something I also hope throughout my research to, to learn more about. Um, and then finally, I think one thing that maybe hasn't been mentioned yet is that some people that may be hesitant um, or maybe <laughs> very strong, feel very strongly uh, against using technology, I think it is so important that when we adopt digital or mobile technologies, in one aspect or one activity, it doesn't mean that it takes place in every aspect of our, our teaching or our practice. So we can make well-informed decisions of having one activity, for example, a photo elicitation assignment, and then having an activity um, where we don't use technology at all. And also not be afraid to talk with our participants or our students about these challenges. Do they notice a difference? How do they experience that? And ask them the same critical questions and the same discussion points that we discuss now together. We shouldn't be hesitant to discuss that with, with our students as well. Um, so what's next? I think some of the key areas um, to explore more deeply, I mean, I think I could come up with like 20 points, um, but I think we should gain a deeper insight insight in mapping or exploring really all the different ways in which we already use it and to explore more practical and creative ways of using digital learning tools in ways that they um, can serve the, the objectives of, of outdoor education or of a specific activity. Um, and I think the more we learn about this, uh, the more we can give actual these practical advices to each other as well. I mean, we're now three PhD students, as far as we know, working on this topic, and each of us aims to, to get to know more about all these challenges in our own projects. But there's really too much to explore um, for just the three of us. And I think one of the challenges we've discussed together is that technology advances probably much quicker than we will be able to finish our PhDs. So we're just trying to keep up here. Um, and finally, I think one, one critical aspect is to better understand the mediating impact of digital technologies on the actual nature experience. So I'm currently writing or exploring a post phenomenological perspective on, on nature experience. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I hope that that 
may help us better understand this, this final, final question. I think that's it for now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Imran. And now uh, to close off the, uh, the presentations, we have Jack Reed. Great. Welcome to those who have just joined us, I should also say. We've got a few, few new faces in there. Thanks for coming. Over to, to you, Jack. Great. Thanks, Simon. Um, and, and yeah, as the chat was going on in the last uh, plenary, I was thinking, my oh, goodness, this is fantastic because a lot of the stuff that's coming up, um, I'm hoping to discuss in these next five minutes. So what do we already know? Um, well, it's important to say that there is a, um, well, a significant amount of literature outside the outdoor education field now um, that focuses on young people's uses and relationships with both network spaces, um, which of course include social media. And something that I have found really helpful here um, is the term the post-digital. Um, and so I wouldn't mind briefly discussing this. And I did write a brief paper in Pathways um, just recently about this as well. I'd be looking to have a glance at it a little bit further. So the post-digital recognizes um, that, especially in a kind of global north context, the, the, this binary that we've already discussed um, between the digital and the non-digital uh, non essentially no longer exists. Um, and we don't need to look very far to see this. Um, now this little device um, that I have here um, is my alarm, it's my diary, it's my camera. Um, it also offers access to my friends um, to work and yes, even to those pesky emails. Um, however, as Florian Kramer and Peter Yandrich recently discussed, um, the post-digital is a, it's a strange term. We, we essentially live in a society that is more and more digital. Um, so the kind of post in post-digital doesn't really make a whole heap of sense. Um, but what the post-digital represents is that the, the digital no longer describes any meaningful difference. Um, the digital is the, the default um, and it is the unescapable condition. So why does that matter for outdoor education? Um, well, if we begin from the standpoint that we no longer have a so-called non-digital sphere, then it's reasonable to suggest at least that the outdoor education is embedded and sustained in a truly digital culture. Um, and I think this is important really when, when thinking about how learning is both embedded and sustained um, for young people in contemporary educational contexts. So that's the post-digital um, and that's the kind of collapsing binary that I mentioned at the end of the plenary there. Um, but moving on to point two, um, there are clearly, I think, many areas to explore here, as has already been mentioned, but one area for, for thoughts came from a really interesting book chapter written by Susan Herring in 2008 um, called Questioning the Generational Divide, Technological Exoticism um, and Adult Constructions of Online Youth Identity. Um, now, in it, she says that when adults use um, words such as unprecedented um, or words such as transformational in relation to the relationships between young people and technology, then adults inadvertently, at least, kind of other the experiences of young people um, in this domain. And Herring explains this issue as the experience gap between young people and adults. So, so really kind of having adults talk about young people's uses of technology, um, it must not be at the expense of listening to learners themselves. And I think this is critical really as we move forward in outdoor education, as we know that there is, for now at least, um, limited literature which centralizes the youth voice in this space. Um, and the second issue actually was brought up by, by Heidi Smith um, in the chat um, not too long ago, um, around the kind of sliding scale of access to technology for young people. So it's estimated that over 3.8 billion people have some form of access to social media across the world, um, but we cannot and indeed should not assume that all young people have equal access to these forms of technology. And I think we can go further here. Um, there are other factors at play for, for young people who do have a smartphone, who, who are connected. Um, for instance, things such as um, intersectional issues around maybe gender, um, sexuality, um, socioeconomic backgrounds um, and ethnicity, and of course there are more, um, we, ha we have to ask how these may begin to affect how young people use network spaces. Um, now I think really these are key areas for the field of education more broadly to, to consider, um, and absolutely key factors for both research and practice 
um, in outdoor education. And finally, um, point three, it's yeah, su super important that we ask where to next. Um, now, I don't want to bring down the mood here by mentioning the, the COVID word, um, but I think this is really important um, when thinking about where next, especially in this context of technology. So um, during lockdowns and, and isolation, um, there is literature now emerging, um, which recognises how network spaces have provided a kind of critical arena for young people's interactions, um, but also for their learning, for their sense of togetherness, um, and also for their sense of belonging. Um, and in the UK context, at least, as, as residential centres have begun, thankfully, reopening, um, I think it's, it's really important to recognise that connectivity for young people has been, and will likely continue to be, um, more important than ever. Um, and I think this is, a, like I say, a, a critical consideration for both research and practice, um, especially as we hopefully, hopefully uh, move toward a post-pandemic society. So I'm over time, I'll end there, but thank you very much. Pass back to Simon. Right, well, I wanna thank uh, our three presenters, Imre Evren Kraligan, Jack Reed, Dave Hills, for your uh, wonderful uh, and informed input today it's just it's it, it kind of feels like um uh almost like uh like i'm cheating by not having to read all this other stuff because i don't need to i don't need to read it at all i just need to know people who have read it all so thanks so much for uh for for the, all the work that you're doing in this it goes on though okay bye everybody <laughs> thanks for joining us today